Hello, my name is Enrique Urrutia, and the purpose of this webinar today is give an overview, you know, for the transition from PrimoGFS from version 2.1-2C or version 3, but only with scope to GMPs, uh, facility inspections, okay? Um, this session includes main changes in the Primus scheme for version 2.1 to version 3.0, including, you know, the timeframes, you know, when the standard, the new version will be, you know, available for customers and certification bodies, um, um, principal changes in the program regulations. We're not going to see all of them, but the most important ones that are important to be considered, you know, by the users of the standards, you know. Uh, the new standard structure, they changed the structure of the, the standard. And also we're going to check the most important changes, you know, in the GMPs, you know, uh, mostly we're going to touch bases with new questions and new requirements in the FSMS, the Food Safety Management System, uh, the Good Manufacturing Practices module, uh, HACCP, and also the new things of the preventative controls, you know, by FISMA regulations. Uh, Primary GFS version uh, 3 was approved by the GFSI on July 2, so now it's a fact that the uh, version 3 has been recognized by the GFSI. Here is, you know, uh, you know, the screenshot of the website of the GFSI, where it's stated, you know, the uh, recognition against, you know, the GFSI version 7.1 requirements. Um, new primal GFS structure. Uh, in version 2.1, we had three modules, the FSMS, uh, one module for the GMPs and GAPs, and one module for the um, uh, uh, HACCP. Now, Primary GFS has divided in seven modules. Uh, the first one stays as in the past, uh, food safety management system that is applicable for all type of operation. It's a kind of the brain, you know, of, of the management of the food safety program. Uh, then we have for the GAPs, for field operations, uh, module two, that now the new name is farm module, in the past was the ranch operation or module. Module three, that is indoor agriculture, that, that's applicable for greenhouses. And module four, that is the harvest crew. In GMPs, we have three modules now. Module five, that is the facility module, uh, known in the past as, you know, module two, the GMP section. Module six, that is the HACCP, that is mandatory for all type of facilities, as in version 2.1. And module seven, uh, who add all the preventative controls uh, according to FISMA regulations. Uh, now, this is optional for facilities. It's not mandatory to use this module when you're audited under version three. Uh, but if you decide to apply it, including this module, the score of this module will be uh, included in the overall score of the inspection. Uh, time frames and transition period for version 3.0. Well, as of today, August 2, uh, the normative documents, you know, program regulations, audit guidelines are still not available for, you know, uh, the users of the standard. Uh, Primus GFS Azul will post them on August 6, you know, so you're going to have access to them starting from August 6, 2018. Uh, in between August 6 and December 31, uh, 2018, auditees, the users of the standard, can schedule and have inspection for either version 2.1-2C, the current version, or version 3. So you are going to have the chance to opt to choose any of them. Uh, in case that you choose to, to continue using version 2.1-2C, uh, if you want or you need to assess, you know, the implementation of your FISMA program or preventative controls in the case of uh, facilities, you can request your inspection, you know, with the add-on or the addendum uh, for FISMA. Yeah? But version 3 will become mandatory from January 1st, 2019. So starting from next year, the first day, uh, will be the only version available, you know, for the users. Um, as I told you before, all Primus GFS version 3 normative documents in English and Spanish will be posted in the Primus GFS website on August 6, 2018, and the link to access them is here in the slideshow at the bottom. 
Next part, we're going to talk about the most important changes in the regulation. These are not all the changes. Yeah, This is part of them. So I extract the most important one that should be, you know, uh, considered for audits, for the users of the standard for version 3. Uh, there are several changes to the program regulations. Some of them are applicable for certification bodies and auditor inspectors. For example, uh, the auditor approval process now is more complicated. There's more requirements. And others are applicable for audits, the users of the standard. But considering the main purpose of this session is to inform audits customers about the changes to consider from their perspective, the following part of the session mostly focus on changes and new regulations that should be considered by you, the audits. First change or first new thing. During the application process, that means when you're uploading all the information or sending to your certification body all your information about, you know, the inspection, there's something new that, needs, that should be informed. Countries of destination per commodity. So if your company intends to sell the products in foreign markets, for example, you want to ship product to UK, you need to inform that during the application process. Uh, of course, this is going to trigger or open several questions related, you know, with compliance with the specific rules of those countries. For example, MRLs, you know, pesticide residues. Uh, the choice, uh, another new thing is the choice to schedule the audit as announced or unannounced. This is super new. If the applicant choose unannounced, the following rule applies. The audit, the audit will be notified 48 hours, two working days before the, the, the inspection. Yeah. If the customer, the LDT, does not accept the first attempt, then the audit will be conducted in a further date as announced. But if you're able, you know, to do the audit, you know, in this unannounced period, uh, the audit report and certificate will display this condition, unannounced. Special attention with your buyers, your clients, in case that they want that special condition in your certificate. Other change, changes to the regulations. Surveillance audits performed by the certification body. This is something brand new in Primal GFS. Each certification body shall conduct surveillance audits for their certified operations. So if you are a certificate holder under version 3, there's chances that you could be selected, you know, for a surveillance inspection. Uh, ideally, each certification body should conduct surveillance audits for the 2% of their certified operations. So if a certification body, let's say, have 100, you know, certificates, uh, at least two of, two of these certificates or operations should, uh, should be uh, selected for a surveillance audit. The selection of operations for surveillance inspection shall be based on risk assessment approach, considering different facts like compliance history. So how many non-compliances or non-conformances do you have in your inspection? Complaints, complaints by the market, by the buyers, you know. Recalls, if you're involved, if your company is involved in a recall, of course, that's increased, increased the chances to be selected for a surveillance audit. And of course, the complexity and the risk of the process and product. And other facts to be considered by the certification body. Uh, in case that your uh, operation, your company has been selected for a, an announce, uh, for a surveillance sorry, inspection, you will receive the notification 48 hours, two working days before the inspection. The first attempt could be rejected only under justifiable reasons, for example, medical conditions. But if the second attempt is rejected, the certificate will be suspended. Other new things, non-conformance and corrective actions. Other absolutely new things in the standard. For all non-conformances, that means applicable questions who were scored with zero points, so it's a complete non-conformance, no a deviation, not a minor, not a major, will be mandatory to submit corrective actions. But if no corrective action is possible, because it's out of the, you know, the chances of the operation or by any other reason, the organization should detail what they do or will do to control that potential risk. Um, something that is not new, but was not clearly explained in the current, you know, regulations of program uh, of uh, Prime GFS 2.1-2C is the second valid point in the slideshow. The corrective, corrective action should include the determination of the cost, the action plan to address immediately the issue, 
the correct the corrective actions taken and preventive measure to prevent the same similar issue from happening again if necessary so this will be uh, this will need to be documented when you upload your corrective actions you know uh, into the prime gfs system documented um and something that is not new but has been clarified uh, for inspection with a score less than 85 percent in the preliminary report is possible to submit corrective actions but even if these corrective actions are accepted the scores will not change then the audit will fail why because to achieve primary gfs certification at least you you should score a 90 percent in the overall score of the Uh, the next section we're going to discuss about the new things or the new requirements in the FSMS or the food safety management system. But these are not the only changes. There's a lot of existing questions where the compliance criteria or the guidelines has been increased or clarification has been provided. Now, will be very easy to catch this once you have, you know, the uh, uh, version three normative documents because usually Primo GFS highlight in red in the normative document what is new. So in the following part of this webinar, we are going to review only the new questions in the FSMS. <clears throat> uh, the first one, 10104. <clears throat> Is there a training management system in place that shows what type of trainings are required for various job roles for specific workers, including who has been trained, when they were trained, which trainings they still need to take and a training schedule. This could be in the form of a training matrix, you know, so you identify all the different positions in the company and then which type of specific training each one of the work, each one of them should receive. Uh, but this is not just to put the plan. Also, this matrix should show the state of advance, you know, in your training. Let's see the compliance criteria or the audit guidelines. The company has a system in place like a training ma matrix that shows that types of trainings are required for various job roles that affect food safety. Who has been trained, when they were trained, which trainings they still need to take, and a training schedule. This question is related to the training program. And this question, we're not going to review the training records. There's other questions for the specific training records. Yeah, This is the overall training plan and the state of advance you know, through the time of your uh, training schedule or training program. 10106, another new question. Where specific industry guidelines or best practices exist for the crop and or product, or product, does the operation have a current copy of the document? Yeah. So, for example, if it's a uh, leafy green operation, a lettuce operation growing in California, uh, California has adhered to the LGMA agreement, the California Leafy Green Agreement. So, copy of the, those guidelines, those regulations should be in place during this inspection. Let's see the uh, audit guidelines. There is a current copy of any specific industry guidelines for the crop and or product available for review. Some examples include the Leafy Green Marketing Agreement, LGMA, uh, the California Cantaloupe Program, the Tomato Good Agricultural Practices, the TGAPs, uh, commodity-specific food safety guidelines for the production, harvest, post-harvest, and processing unit operation of herbs, etc. This question will be not applicable if there's no specific industry guidelines or best practices exist for the crop and or product. Next slide, 10205. Uh, are all records and test results that can have an impact on the food safety program reviewed and signed off by the person responsible for the food safety program? So let's go back a little bit, you know, for the FSMS. There's a question where, uh, there's a need to identify, you know, the, the organizational structure, you know, of the food safety people in the organization. So there should be identified who is the responsible of the food safety program. And that person should be the one, you know, taking care of this new question. The guidelines refers that records and test results should be signed off by the designated person responsible for the food safety program within a reasonable time frame. The sign off should not be done by the same person who carry out the monitoring activity. If any issues are detected, corrective action should be documented. So for any type of product of monitoring records, you know, like uh, 
monitoring of antimicrobials in a wash tub, you know, post-harvest treatments, cleaning, wherever, uh, lab test, there should be someone sign off, signing off those documents. Uh, that means that person is reviewing them. Yeah? And that person should be different than the person who complete that form. Yeah? For example, if we have an operator, you know, completing, you know, uh, the levels of uh, chlorine and pH in a wash tap, the person signing off this, this record should be someone different than him. And according to the guidelines, should be the food safety program responsible or the designated person. Yeah? 10405. Calibration. This really was an existing requirement, but helps a lot to have this in a different question. Currently, in version 2.1, there's a question, question about, you know, calibration SOPs for all type of, you know, devices related with food, with food safety, thermometers, scales, wherever. Yeah. And the same question requires, you know, that, that question currently requests an SOP and records. But now, PrimoGFS has split this in two questions, one for the SOPs and another one for the records. So this new question, but not new requirement, address. Are calibration and or accuracy verification records maintained and are they consistent with the requirements outlined in the SOPs for instruments and measuring devices requiring calibration? Calibration and or accuracy verification records should be available for all uh, applicable equipment and shows the frequency of testing, the, me the testing method and the acceptable range of variation. Corrective action should be recorded. So in other words, this is the implementation and the recording of the calibration SOPs, for example, for RP meters, uh, scales, you know, used to measure um, cleaning chemicals, uh, thermometers, that kind of stuff, you know, uh, at facility level. And don't forget, this question, this, this question requests a record. So if we go back to the question 10205, the one that we reviewed previous, someone else than the one doing those calibrations or verification should sign off those records. Uh, 10801, brand new question. Is there a written food fraud vulnerability assessment and protection plan for all the type of fraud, including all incoming and outgoing products? The guidelines refers that there should be a vulnerability assessment and comprehensive protection plan for all type of food fraud. That includes economically motivated hazards, economically motivated food safety standards, uh, like uh, a pound with less than one pound, yeah? Uh, adulterated substances, for example, if you're using antimicrobials in a wash tub, uh, it's a concern, you know, the quality of those antimicrobials. So in the risk assessment, you should address, uh, for example, that those uh, uh, chemicals should be provided by the formal supplier, yeah, and there should be evidence that they're approved for the food for the for the industry, that kind of stuff. Adulterated substances, theft, tampering, simulation, diversion, or gray market, intellectual property rights, and counterfeiting, yeah. So this risk assessment must be documented, you know, and should consider all the inputs and outputs from your production process in regards to this type of concerns. Mm, 10803. Mm, sounds like a new question, but really it's not. Currently, we have a question about um, uh, the food defense, you know, risk assessment. You know, question I think, as I remember, is 10801 uh, in the current version of Prime with GFS in the FSMS section. But this question is going a little beyond of that risk assessment or clarifying what is looking for, you know, in regards, you know, the risk assessment for biodefense or biosecurity. Are records associated with the food defense plan and its procedures being maintained, including monitoring, corrective actions, and verification records were appropriate? And the guidelines address, the records required in the food defense plan should be maintained in accordance with the details of the plan and its, and its associated procedures. These records are also subject to the document controls and record requirements of this module. So putting this in an example, uh, for example, if your bio, bio defense or biosecurity risk assessment uh, identifies that all the workers in the facility <clears throat> should be trained, you know, in regards to you know, how to identify, you know, people from, you know, his, that should not be there and any other type of biosecurity or biodefense policy. In this question, we need to see those records. Okay, show me those you know, uh, training records for your staff. So in other words, any document that should be issued according or control measure uh, as the outcome of the risk assessment for biosecurity is reviewed in this question. 
Okay, that's all for the module one, but as I told you, these are not all the changes, these are only the new questions. So I strongly recommend you to do an in-depth review once you know the documents are ready in the PrimeGFS site on August 6. Module five, facility. The old GMP, module two GMP section in version 2.1-2C. New questions. Uh, 505.11, is fresh potable drinking water really accessible to worker? Yeah. Uh, fresh potable water meeting the quality standard for drinking water, in this, in this case, in the United States, according to the EPA drinking water standard, so that's targeting potable coliforms and E. coli, no presence, um, should be provided in all places of employment for drinking, fo following local and national laws. The term potable, uh, meaning that the water is of drinking water quality. Uh, example, the EPA drinking water standard or equivalent. Uh, auditors should verbally verify the source of the water at the time of the audit. Uh, portable drinking water dispensers should be designed, constructed, and maintained in a sanitary condition. Visual inspection of these items. Uh, capable of being closed, so they should have a lid. Not be, the water should not be exposed. And equipped with a tap. The water should be dispensed in single-use drinking cups, so no reusable cups or glasses, or by fountains. Uh, common drinking cups and other common utensils are prohibited. Brand new question. Uh, there's nothing that refers here in a specific for a water test. We're expecting to see the interpretation guidelines uh, to clarify this once you know the normative documents are released on August 6th. But as is now, um, there's no specific requirements of a water test. But using common sense, if the, the operation is providing, you know, water, you know, from municipal water, mm, yeah, it's a, in theory, it's a safe water. But if the water is pulled by a well, uh, maybe there's problems with total coliform. So in that case, as a method, you know, to prove that the water is potable, a water test should be provided. Yeah? But let's see what happens in August 6 when we have, you know, the final document. 505.13, are workers issued uh, uh, with non-reproducible identification like badges, company ID cards, etc. Yeah? Uh, guidelines refers that the workers should have personal identification that link them to the company. The ID should have the worker's number, photo, and position within the organization. Time cards with photo identification are acceptable. The ID cards, if worn on the outer garment, should be firmly attached so as not to be a so as not to be a food safety hazard. If it stores on one's person, this is also acceptable. For example, the ID card, you know, uh, should be provided a ch challenge if, for example, the employee, the worker, keep them in their pockets. And hand sanitation would be required after showing it to the auditor. Yeah? Um, all workers should have IDs, including management and agency labor. Agency labor might have agency ID cards where a check and arrival. Uh, companies with less less than 20 uh, workers are not expected to have an ID system. So if the facility operates with less than 20 people, this could be optional. Uh, if they're not using them, uh, this question will become non-applicable. But if there's more than 20 employees, yes, this requirement applies. ID cards or badges should be, you know, provided for uh, workers. 5.901. The two following questions are very related. Maps, you know, identification of the external areas, the first question, and the second one, identification of the internal area of the facility. Let's see one by one. 50901, is there a site plan showing the location, adjacent lights, the sites, roads, water sources, storm water, wastewater, and other relevant features? So there should be a site map or a similar document, like a photograph, a drawing, maybe could be, you know, a screenshot taken from Google Maps, something like that, yeah? where you can, you know, describe, show, you know, the different features of the facility by the outside. Um, this uh, map or photograph or draw should consider, you know, the facility buildings and the location of permanent water fixtures like wells, you know, mains, and water systems, including any holding tanks and water capture for reuse. Stone water, wastewater, septic system, effluent lagoons or ponds, surface water body, bodies are also identified. So this is the map by the outside, you know, of the facility buildings. Now, the next question, now we go to the inside of the facility. So really, these two questions could be just one document. 50902, 
Is there a facility floor plan showing the lay layout of the building, production areas, storage areas, water sources, and fixtures? Layout of the equipment and traffic flow patterns. And the guidelines refer that there should be a facility floor plan, map, a drawing, indicating production areas, storage areas, water fixtures, and drainage. Layout of equipment and traffic flow pattern of equipment and workers. The flow pattern for food product workers and equipment should prevent raw material from coming into contact with finished products. Flow is a, ideally in one direction and follows a logical sequ sequence from raw material handling to finished product storage. That's an ideal condition, not a reason for a downscore. Yeah? Now, there's another question, you know, who refers to potential cross-contamination. So if there's any issue, you know, in the layout of the, for example, the equipment, uh, is not going to be downscore here. Will be downscore in the question specific about the risk of cross contamination according to the layout of the equipment and the process. Next question, 51407. Are there records showing verification of cleaning and sanitizing chemicals concentration? Really? This is not a new requirement. This was in BIV, you know, in question 22703 and 22704 in the current version. But now it's an independent question just to clarify this, you know, for the users of the staff. Uh, where cleaning and sanitizing chemicals are mixed on site, there should be record of verification of the antimicrobial concentration. So, for example, if you know, according to the cleaning SOPs, uh, there's the need to prepare a chlorinated solution, so that means mixing chlorine with water. Uh, the SOP should, you know, for that should refer a strength, a concentration of that chemical, let's say 150 parts per million. So. In this question, there should be records showing, proving that someone took, you know, the strength, you know, of those, you know, cleaning, you know, solutions, you know, before start using them. Now, this question could become NA if no mixing is taking place on site. So that happens when the operation decide to use pre-mix solutions. So in other words, you don't need to prepare them; they're ready to use. But if you're mixing, you need to have these records. 51601. Mm, really not a new requirement, but it's a new question. This is related, you know, for example, with the swaps for equipment and environmental swap, that kind of stuff. Let's see the question and the guideline. Is there a written risk based, scientifically valid microbiological testing program that may include pathogen testing and details program design, sonal approach, food contact, non food contact surfaces? Spend sprout irrigation water. That thing is, for example, when someone is growing uh, alfalfa sprouts. Yeah? Um, test and hold, uh, testing, you know, product before shipping, yeah? water, ice, etc. Rational for the organism tested for, procedures for sampling and testing, surface water, products, ingredients, etc. Timing and frequency of testing should be defined in this document, and the testing methodology, methodology to use. The lab that performed the test. And the, and the most important part, the acceptable result thresholds, thresholds level for each organism. A brief parenthesis, let's say that you're doing, you know, your swap program for food contact surfaces. You could decide to use a generic indicator like total plate count or a specific pathogen uh, uh, test like salmonella, listeria, etc. If you decide, for example, to test for listeria, it's obvious, you know, that the threshold is negative. So there's no but there's no presence of this area. But in the case of generic indicators like total plate count, uh, the company could decide you know to set a limit and they need to document that limit. Uh, there's several references in the internet or you can de define your own threshold, but that should be documented. How many colonies of total plate count, that means uh, um, aerobic uh, microbes, are present in the surface, which is uh, up to when is good and when becomes bad. Yeah. Um, let's see the let's see the compliance criteria. A written risk-based, scientifically valid microbi microbiological testing program has been developed and is used to verify the effectiveness of clinic cleaning and sanitation programs and or meet customer or other specific requirements. The program should include the de include design, sonal approach, food or non-food contact, spent irrigation water, test and hold, water, ice, products, ingredients, etc. Rational for the organism tested. Yeah? So, for example, that's not sounds like a very good idea to test in a cold room, total coliforms. A uh, cold room, if the temperature is below 4 Celsius degrees, uh, really the 
chances of total coliform multiplication is very low, but Listeria not. You know, Listeria can survive in between uh, zero Celsius degrees, a little bit over zero Celsius degrees, up to 45 Celsius degrees. So you need to decide, you know, uh, based on scientific, scientific, you know, information, what to test. Yeah? Um, uh, the program uh, should uh, include the procedure for sampling and testing, you know, surface, water, product, ingredients, etc. should be defined in the document. Timing and frequency of testing, so monthly, weekly, you know. The testing methodology, which type of lab method is going to be used. The lab that performed the test, so you need to identify the lab or the labs that you potentially can use for this, and the acceptable result threshold level for each organism. Any hold and release test and hold activity should also be recorded. There may be some overlap with preventative controls and or HACCP uh, or preventative control topic. For that, we're going to talk later and when we review, you know, the module seven. 516.02. 516.01 is the program. Now, this is the execution of the program, the requirements on, on 516.02. Are there record of microbiological test results and does testing meet the program requirements? So, if you write a program and the program has been well developed, now is the time to put it in practice. So, if you decide, for example, to conduct swaps in the specific equipment in a monthly frequency, well, you need to have the evidence that you are doing that. So. You need to have those lab tests. Compliance group criteria addressed. Testing should be recorded, including organism tested for the testing methodology, lab that performed the test, details of the sampling sites, when the test occurred, and the results, including units of measure. If any issues are detected, corrective action should be recorded. Testing should meet written program requirements, including sonal approach, food contact, non-food contact surfaces, suspend proud irrigation water, test and hold, water, ice, etc. Um, something important to consider. Almost all the information required in this record, who are you know usually lab results, you know, provide the document provided by the lab, you know. Uh, almost all this information is there, but special attention with the details of the sampling sites. You need to be able to match, for example, a swap test with a specific area where this was tested. So if that is not in the lab, you know, uh, report, uh, don't forget to keep record of where those samples were taken to avoid problems in this control point or this question. Mm, next question, 516.06, other regular or other tests, um, same. Spend sprout irrigation water, product, raw ingredients, etc., that are performed for any reason. Example, customer requirement. Let's say that your customer is requiring, you know, testing for E. coli of your products or listeria. Well, if that is a requirement by your customer, you need to address those requirements. And this question becomes applicable. So this question is a, a, a conditional question. It depends on these facts. Yeah? But also by best practices could be the decision to test for, for example, in product E. coli or salmonella or, or listeria, or by regulatory requirements. And does testing meet the program requirements? So it's not just to test. Those tests should be compared about a metric, you know, that should be included in your program that we discussed in the first part of this part of question related with, you know, microbiological or lab testing. Testing should be recorded, including organism tested for the testing methodolo methodology, lab that performed the test, details of the sampling sites, when the test occurred, the results, including units of measure, and appropriate corrective actions were relevant. Product testing may include microbiological, heavy metals, pesticides, dioxins, aflatoxins, and other natural toxins, etc. And of course, the test, the outcome of this test should meet the written program requirements. If not, corrective action should be implemented, but that comes now. 516.07, we continue with the same thing of, you know, testing, yeah? 516.07, are there written risk-based corrective action procedures for when an acceptable test results are received that de describe the steps to be taken, assign responsibility for taking those, correct, those steps or corrective actions, the steps to ensure the cause is identified, for example, root cause analysis, and corrected to minimize the potential for product contamination. So this is a document to explain how you're going to deal in case that you receive an unsuitable result, you know, by your laboratory. 
There should be written corrective action procedures detailing actions to take when unacceptable results are received, based on that risk that contamination could result in contaminated food and consumer illness that describe the steps to be taken. Assign the responsibility for taking those steps. Who? You know, the position, the name that will be responsible to do with this corrective action. And the step to ensure the cause is identified. For example, you can use as a reference the root cause analysis or the Ishikawa diagram. There's a lot of techniques, you know, or tools that can help you to determine the cause of this problem. One of the best is the common sense. And correct it to minimize the potential for product contamination. This may include root cause analysis, intensified sampling and testing, review of uh, standard operation procedures, sanitation and maintenance programs, etc. So this is how to deal when something bad comes, you know, from the laboratory in terms of lab results. 51608, conditional question. This question only applies when there's unsuitable results in those lab testing that we address in 51607. Other record of corrective actions taken after unsuitable testing result that describe the steps taken, responsibility for taking those steps, and actions taken to ensure that the cause of contamination has been identified and corrected. So, this is the implementation of the corrective action procedures stated in 51607. You need to have records of how did you deal, you know, in case that you receive any unsuitable result from your laboratory in regards, you know, your testing program. Um, the next two questions are new questions, but there's a relation with existing question. I'm not sure if you remember, but at the end of the GMPs, there's a set of questions about, um, I think it's section 231, yeah, or one and 02. There should be cleaning, uh, sorry, there should be record of inspection regarding temperature and cleanliness of the shipping tracks. Well, that's question that still exist. But now the new thing is that there should be a specific SOPs in how to conduct this monitoring about temperature and cleanliness of the shipping track. So the first one is I1704. Is there a documented procedure for checking truck trailer temperature prior to shipping? Uh, the guidelines refer there should be a documented procedure to check truck trailer temperature prior to shipment. Where relevant requirement from the organization that has contracted the carrier should be followed, including the use of, of time temperature recording devices, thermographs. Yeah, so this is the document to explain how the trailers, the shipping trucks, you know, temperature should be monitored. What items to use, you know, who's responsible, that kind of thing. 51706, very similar question, but now instead of temperature, is the sanitary condition of the truck, the trailer. Yeah? Is there a documented procedure for reviewing the sanitary condition of truck trailers that will transport the product? Truck trailers or other transportation system like railway, railway carriages should be checked for the sanitary condition and records maintained. Attributes checks should include cleanliness, trailer fitness for intended use, design and construction materials, issues from previous loads, pest free, odor free, load segregation, etc. There should be a documented procedure to cover this check. Where relevant requirement from the organization that has contracted the carrier should be followed. And that's all the new questions for the GMP part of the audit, uh, but don't forget, uh, there's a lot of existing questions where the um, expectation or the guideline has been increased or there's comments about clarification that give a better understanding of what is looking for, you know, the standard in that specific question. So I encourage you to read, you know, the um, audit guidelines when they're released uh, on August 6. Next section, HACCP, module 6. Not too many new things. 60105. Is there a documented evidence that the flow chart been, has been verified on site? So uh, currently in version 2.1, there's a question that requests that there should be a flow chart of the process, you know, the different steps of the process, you know, and the inputs to the process. Now, the new thing is that chart must be verified. So that should, be, and that verification must be recorded. Uh, let's see the uh, compliance or guidelines criteria. Flow diagram should be verified on site and signed and dated by the HACCP coordinator to confirm it reflects the process at different moments and there are no missing steps. <coughs> Insufficient detail, missing step, etc., will undermine the hazard analysis processes. 
but any an inaccuracies in the flow diagram should be scored in question 6 or 1 or 4. The system question though, in the current version uh, related with the flow diagram. This question, don't forget, is not looking for the, you're not, uh, or the auditor will not be assessing the flow diagram. We'll be assessing, you know, that the HACCP coordinator review it and put a date and a signature of approval for this flow diagram. But if there's any problem in the flow diagram, that will be the specific question about flow diagram. 602.11, is the HACCP system verified when operational changes are made and at least once every 12 months? And the guidelines address that the HACCP system should be reviewed by the HACCP team when operational changes are made to products, new equipment, modifications in the process, etc. And at least every 12 months. So if there's no changes, there should be a review at least every 12 months, annual review. Including the product description, process flows, hazard analysis, CCP decisions, CCP recording, and worker training to ensure that the program is up to date and working properly. Where emerging issues such as recalls, outbreaks, new research, etc., are relevant to the products and or processes at hand, consideration of a hazard review should occur. Documented retraining or educational session may be necessary. The review should include a written record which demonstrates each of the elements of the plan have been reviewed, verified as being accurate, appropriate, and there should be a change record included in the plan to, to track over time. The HACCP team should inform workers involved of the review outcomes in case, of course, that there's changes, you know, in the HACCP plan. And that's all. Just two new questions in the HACCP section. Don't forget that primary GFS, the HACCP section, is based in HACCP Codex. HACCP Codex has been the same for a long time. So not too many new things to add there. Just, I think, they're polishing a couple of things that, you know, could be uh, a concern. And um, the last part of this training, preventative controls, module seven. Don't forget that I explained in the opening of this session uh, that the preventative prevent preventive controls module is optional. But if you decide to use it, the score of this module will be included in the overall score of your primary GFS update. The following section, I'm going to only review the new question. Don't forget that the preventative controls, the current phase addendums for version 2.1 are a fact. So I'm just touching bases for the new things added for the addendum for facilities for FISMA, the preventative controls. 70206, other documents that show validation work for the process preventative controls. And was this validation work performed by or overseen by a preventative control qualified individual? Uh, the guidelines address that the process preventative control should have documented validation work performed or overseen by a qualified individual. The validation work could include peer-reviewed scientific literature, legislative the, the documentation, trade association guidance, implant observation and testing, etc. Where useful and relevant, other preventative control types like sanitation preventative control should be supported by validation work dated between 90 days of starting production. So mostly probably here you're going to justify your preventative control through uh, validation studies issued by, for example, universities. Yeah? as a way to support what, what you're doing meets the purpose in terms of preventative controls. Um, next new question in the preventative controls module is our set of add-on at this time, 70207. Do the preventive control plan, charts, and or procedures indicate that specific responsibilities has been assigned for the monitoring, recording, and corrective action implementation? For, so this question is applicable, you know, for the preventative controls identified through, you know, the risk assessment, yeah? And there should be a document that, is, that um, clarifies or identifies the specific responsibilities, you know, um, for the monitoring, recording, and corrective action implementation of each preventive control to ensure compliance. This is an analogy of a, as a program with critical control points. But there should be someone assigned, you know, to monitor the critical control point. And usually the same person is responsible uh, to uh, record, you know, the outcome of the monitoring, etc. And also corrective action. Sometimes the corrective action could be uh, designated for someone else. 
Have the preventative controls as part of the food safety plan reanalysis review it when operational changes are made in the facility, process, equipment, ingredients, packaging, wherever, and at at least every three years, doing an analogy with the HACCP, you know, review, HACCP is at least annually, but in the preventative controls or, the, or in this section, uh, is only every three year mandatory unless there's changes in the facility, process, equipment, ingredients, packaging, etc. Uh, the preventive, preventive control should be reviewed by the preventive control team when operational changes are made and at least every three years, including the product description, process flow, hazard analysis, preventive control decisions, preventive control recording and worker training to ensure that the program is up to date and working properly. Where emerging issues such as recalls and outbreaks, new research, etc., are relevant to the products and or processes at hand, consideration of preventive control review should occur. Documented retraining or educational session may be necessary. The review should include a written record which demonstrates each of the elements of the plan had been reviewed, verified as being accurate, appropriate, and there should be a change record included in the plan to track changes over time. The preventive control team should inform workers involved of the review outcome. And well, that's all. I hope that this will be this will be useful for you. But as I told you before, this is just an overview of the new version. So I encourage you to do your own review once these documents are uh, released by ASUL on August 6th. Uh, thank you very much for your time. See you for the next webinar.